好，接着下来呢，是也是一个对谈，那会以英语的形式。如果需要翻译机的朋友呢，可以凭您的证件到我们的服务台来进行兑换哈。我们接下来呢，要邀请到的是全球串流影音的霸主 Netflix， 来分享第一手的采购与监制 Netflix 韩剧经验，以及如何与国际平台打交道，把韩流输出全世界。这个环节我们邀请到的主持人是文化内容策进院的柯子怡顾问。我们欢迎他。同时邀请上来分享的是来自 Netflix 的 Kim Min Yong， 他是亚太地区除印度外的内容副总裁。She's the Vice President of Content Netflix APEC X India. Let's welcome them. Good morning. Welcome to NMEA Asia Hub Summit 2022. It's my pleasure to be here this morning to help NMEA and Taiwan welcome a very special guest. She is the Vice President of Content for Netflix APAC, excluding India, and today she's here to share a little bit about the content strategy for Netflix for the Asia Pacific region. And today we'll also be talking a little bit about the importance of harnessing the power of authentic local storytelling. Please help me welcome Ms. Min Yong Kim. Good morning, Min. And it, it's not welcome to Taipei. It's welcome back to Taipei.、Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I've been here multiple times. The food always brings me back.、So. <laughs> uh, well, before we begin, before before we begin with Min,、uh, we have to first thank you,、uh, thank Min for joining us so close to the holiday season, and in the spirit of the holiday season, Min has brought us a gift.、Uh, she's brought a sizzle reel from Netflix, which is showcasing some of the biggest titles from the region. And also、uh, some of the the, the the Taiwanese titles, other、uh, Chinese language titles coming up.、Uh, so we would like to share that with you now. But first, we'd like to ask also that, out of respect for our special guests, that you leave your phones down and refrain from recording any video or audio or taking photos, and just stay in the moment and be present and enjoy being part of the audience for this exclusive sneak peek at Netflix's、uh, sizzle reel. みんな正常な精神状態が保てなくなってる。違うの。Relax。俺、全然あるんがあにじゃな。嗯，在一个月内呢，看谁先找到结婚对象。好，好，好。이스니다。那你们卖什么？この行かれたゲームが何なのか。ゲームイルプニミダ。So, so my first takeaway from that is, Min, you and your team have been very busy.、Uh, we have had a very busy past few years.、Sure. And my second takeaway is, I can tell the audience is already trying to figure out how much time they're going to have to spend on Netflix in the next half year year. You may have to spend the rest of、uh, your holidays at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, Min, before we dive into it,、uh, wonder if you could share a little bit about yourself and your journey at Netflix. Um, I joined Netflix in 2016 November.、Um, I vividly remember because I was one of the one of the few first hire uh, uh, of the content team in、uh, in Asia office.、Uh, when I first joined, I was based out of Singapore, but working on making sure that we bring Korean content to our service to 
please our members. And because we were very new, Netflix was very new in the market in Asia in general, the, the key was in earning the trust of our partners. So I spent a lot of time traveling back and forth to Korea, knocking on the doors, um, uh, you know, in a, in a backpack, in my sneakers. You know, I would go there for two weeks, have about, I counted one, once, have about around like 50 meetings, and by the end of two weeks, I would be like, you know, if I have one more meeting, I may die, and then I would come back. <laughs> so it was a lot of meeting the partners to earn their trust, but at the same time, Netflix is also a business, and I, it was my job to make sure that the company sees the value of Korean content, to make sure that Korean content is going to be the big driver for not only Korea, but uh, our growth in Asia. So making sure that I make the right choices, uh, even when I make the wrong choices, making sure that I, I am very candid and transparent about the learnings and making sure the company learns together was a very important thing. So, so that journey uh, is how I started. And with that, um, here I am. Sounds like it's been an ongoing process also from the beginning, from very much zero, ground zero, and then working up to where you are now uh, with the, uh, the, the, the market. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and uh, to be honest, at the very beginning of uh, my time at Netflix and uh, growing Korean content offering, it really has been my partners in Korea that, was, that has passion for really uh, growing the Korean entertainment industry that helped me to make sure that I can show Netflix that investing in Korea was the right thing to do for the business. What would you say over the, the, the course of that process, uh, ramping up in Korea, was maybe the, uh, the, the inflection point, the change, where everything changed for Netflix Korea? So for, for the company, it was, it was slowly showing the possibility of what a Korean content can do. It, Korean content already had a big fan base. You know, I, Netflix cannot, I cannot take the credit that we made Korean content where it is because Korean content already had that fan base. But... Uh, I wanted to make sure that it becomes more than romantic comedy. It becomes, it becomes a genre. I wanted to make sure that it, it becomes a stable, very firm genre that people around the world will enjoy. So we started making big bets. Uh, a show like Kingdom, like, uh, like Sweet Home, like Extracurricular, making sure that we diversify the types of Korean content we bring to the service. Shows that may not, previously, that may not have been uh, very straightforward in, in terms of the formula that we had that gets uh, a lot of popularity and earns a lot of money. So it was really important to make sure that I, I, have, I diversify the approach to enable uh, different types of storytelling. The things that they, the Korean industry was already great at, but the finding the stories that uh, our creators weren't able to tell before. And when I talked to the creators in the industry, uh, because Netflix is a global platform, a lot of the times I would get pitches that they want to make, when they want to make a global show, they would pitch me a show in English. They wanted to make a show with our teams in America, in Hollywood, because English show equal global show. But Kingdom actually has changed a lot of that. Our producers, our creators realize by telling a story with a great vision, uh, telling a story that they know that they, that's really dear to their heart, they realize that Netflix as a service will help find the audience all over the world. And a Korean language content itself can become a global show. And that was a big turning point to how a lot of uh, our partners and creators in the industry uh, started to look at us differently as a partner and started to really focus on making a show that they are really passionate about. That leads into kind of uh, part of what this, today's discussion has been so far. It's not quite noon yet, but we've already heard several times from the different panelists how do we take Taiwan Global, uh, can Taiwan Global, we must take Taiwan Global, uh, and we've heard also about global content and, and global markets and global success. 
At the same time, we've also heard about local shows and local stories, local markets. Uh, you've talked about before yourself, you know, the importance of being able to create content for your local market first before striving for global success. Can, can you talk about the, the relationship between global and market, uh, local a little bit? That's something, I mean, we've talked about this mm. yesterday a lot as well. That is something we're trying to figure out how to best describe what we truly want to mm. convey to our partners and our creators. As a, as a, as a platform, we always say local impact first. Mm. What, what we mean is we want to make sure that we satisfy our members in the local market uh, and we as a service, the algorithms or the product that we have will help find audiences around the world. And we, we will make sure that this show uh, is distributed globally to reach the audiences around the world. And the reason that a show really needs to be locally authentic is because if that show does not find a big uh, find that does not please the members in in the market where that story can resonate, it is difficult to really reach the audience who may have a similar taste outside of Taiwan. If we think from the creator's perspective, when we say uh, local first, what we're trying to say is we want to create we want you to tell the story that you are good at. We want you to be tell the story, not, so, not something that you don't know, but something that you know, but with a bigger vision, with a bigger imagination. Something that you, that you have imagined before, but you may not, you know, our audiences may not know, but you know that the audiences in Taiwan will be able to enjoy. I think that those are the types of the shows that we envision that is are, that are going to be locally impactful, but also be able to travel globally. Does it make sense? Uh, I think so. I think so. So, so. Sounds like authenticity is a key word here. Yeah. Personal stories, uh, things that really resonate right, with you, right. the creator. I think a good, really, really good example, and I promise this is the last time I'll talk about Squid Game. Um, Squid Game is a great example because Squid Game is a truly locally authentic story. The, the game Squid Game is when we first uh, discussed with Director Hwang, the, the game Squid Game is, is only known in Korea. And to be honest, not all generations know Squid Game. But we, the, the game itself was the core essence of what, uh, uh, it, it represents what we were trying to tell in that story. So that itself was really important. So we didn't want to give, give up on that Squid Game. And that, that's, that's what we did when we really decided the titles too. Mm. At first, uh, we've, I've, we've mentioned this multiple times in, 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 uh, in media. So we first named the title to round six because we wanted to make it more easier to our global audience uh, because Squid Game doesn't come off very intuitively to our global audience. But we really wanted to be true to the story. So we decided to stay with the Squid Game. As we try to choose the, the games within the show, uh, we also wanted to make sure that this story is, not some, uh, is something that resonates with the Korean audience. So it was really important to find those games where our audiences feel, it, it's a, it's a, it brings nostalgia. It's a, it's a game that they used to play as a child. So that one was also very important. We did put a lot of effort in making sure that we choose a game that is simple enough for the global audience to uh, understand. So where we start is make, really making sure that we find the locally authentic story, but making sure that we try to make it as, uh, as accessible uh, as possible and that, so that it can resonate with the audiences even outside of Korea as well. So authenticity, uh, accessibility also. Yes. Uh, and it sounds like uh, when we're talking about uh, local stories, doesn't necessarily uh, mean it's mutually exclusive from travelability, that, that you can have both right, in, right. in a show. Yeah. Right, right. I, th I think, uh, I think there are, we, we have so many members around the world and we want to make sure we bring joy to all of those members. And you know, it will be, our job will be so much easier if they like the they like same kind of show. But, Everybody has a different taste. And it is really important for us to make sure that we 
provide our, our members with a variety of a must-watch content. And sometimes it will be a big, uh, a big ambitious show that can appeal to the global audience that travels around the world. Sometimes it will be a show that, that may only work in the local market with, with uh, maybe only work in the local country, maybe a couple of other countries around Asia. So we want to make sure that we become a destination for our creators to be able to tell different types of stories, not just one type of story that works globally. Okay. You've already mentioned in the last couple of minutes members and the importance of members and keeping them happy, bringing them joy. Uh, so it feels like uh, you're kind of the bridge between your members and then also the creators in all the different local markets. I think where, where Nefris really tries to focus on is whatever we do, that um, our ultimate goal is to bring member joy. And in our work with the creators, it is important for us to be giving good experience to our creators and our partners so that we can bring member joy. Uh, I think that's, that's our, all, that has always been our ultimate goal. And that is something, you know, it's, it's, we, Netflix is known to be an innovative company. Mm -hmm. But I think when it comes to creativity and when it comes to how we make content, it's always back to basic. We always need to make sure we bring member joy and we please our consumers. Well, uh, speaking of that, uh, speaking of how you work with local then, uh, you've said before, uh, you talked about the importance of building teams on the ground in Japan, Korea, and India, and finding the best talent to communicate with that creative community, meaning those local creative communities. Uh, what, what does that look like for you, working with the individual local co uh, communities between Netflix and then local talent? So if I, if I recall the role that I played when I was building Slate in Korea, my job and everybody that works on Netflix, our job is to be the uh, uh, is to bridge the gap between what Netflix wants and what our local community wants or used to. Uh, and I think we, we don't want to say, hey, this is how Netflix does it. You have to do it this way. That's not what we want. And that is not how we work. We want to work with the local community. But we also don't want to say, you're, we are, uh, I know you used to do it a certain way. Let's just keep it that way. We want to be able to uh, be a partner in making sure that we always find innovative ways to change the way we do things or find bigger vision of the story or be innovative in the production technology. Uh, so our role becomes really trying to find that gap. And that's why having our employees, our, our content team, not only the content team, our executives around the world, who really understands on local market, but at the same time, uh, educating them to understand what Netflix wants so that they can actually bridge that gap. Uh, so that becomes an important strategy for us. So it sounds like the teams, uh, whether it's regionally or locally, are doing a lot of the heavy lifting, uh, interfacing with the local teams and uh, bringing that synergy between all the local stories and then trying to uh, figure out a way to bring them to, to different markets. And it sounds, I mean, based on what, what we've talked about and what you've mentioned uh, today, Kingdom is, again, just an example of that, where, you know, is a, a show that maybe may not have been able to be produced uh, in the traditional local market in Korea, but when Netflix came along, it gave them the opportunity to explore this local story, but in a way that uh, maybe they would have otherwise been able to. Yeah, Kingdom is a great example. That that's it's it's one of our favorite story. Um, you know, it was it was our Korea creative executive who who knew uh, writer Kim Uni, uh, who had the who had the opportunity to meet her in person and asked our favorite question, like, "What story do you want to tell?" And she took some time and came back to us with. Kingdom, something that she had, she really wanted to tell us. Uh, she wanted to turn into a show 10 years ago. She could have, she could have made it, but not, not uh, be able to fulfill the vision that she had. So she had kept it for that long. And when we asked the question, she sort of brought, she brought it, brought Kingdom to us. And those were the type of uh, stories that we wanted. Something that was that's differentiated. Something that you know. Now, uh, Korea zombie is a thing. 
But that was the first Korean zombie, one of the first Korean zombie show. And at that time, nobody thought that Koreans don't like watching Korean zombies. That's what people thought. But now Korean zombie is a thing, right? So it's, it, it was about making sure that give, being, the third, being the destination for our creators to tell the story that they wanted to tell uh, and making sure that we support, we, we give enough resources to support uh, the, uh, and create the best version of their vision, uh, I think is what we aspire to be. And I, I, I believe, uh, you know, the kingdom as our partner, uh, as one of our first show, the partner had to also, not only us, but partner has to also go through a lot of trial and error and, and difficulties. They, they were our partner and experienced our mistakes together as well. Similar to, uh, I'm pretty sure, like Rita uh, working on Agent From Above uh, as like one of the first like biggest VFX show that we were making in Taiwan, she will actually be going through a lot of <laughs> difficulties with us as well. And I'm pretty sure Hank has, has gone through a lot of that through uh, Victim's Game and Copycat Killer as well. So th these first uh, partners, while I say all these fancy words and we want to be the you know, best destination to f realize their vision, they do go through a lot of difficulties in helping us find the best Netflix Taiwan way for us. In, in, in America, we call that growing pains. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's part of the process of trying to get onto the next stage. Uh, well, uh, again, going from Kingdom years ago to where Netflix is now with respect to APAC, you know, so much has changed. We've had the pandemic in between. Pandemic is kind of now, now hopefully in the rear view mirror. Uh, how is, how, how is that, how are where we are now uh, changing, influencing the content strategy for APAC and especially with respect to, to Chinese language development? I think during the couple of years of this pandemic, what really changed was how people consume watch content and what they watch. And I think for me as a content executive, where I can focus on is what they're watching. With the amount of content that gets consumed like increasing significantly, people have been more open to different kinds of uh, content. And uh, more, more simply, uh, not only scripted series, there, there is an increasing demand of not only scripted series where we, we, we used to focus a lot on, now we need to get into scripted film, uh, unscripted documentaries. So there, there has been an increasing demand in variety of different types of content. So I would say that is number one. What is more exciting as a content executive is that the We've seen through examples like Parasite, Squid Game, Alice in Borderland, Lupin, La Casa de Papel, and Incantation, that the border of, and the language barrier of this content has, I cannot say it's gone, has lowered. And that one inch barrier that our, uh, that Director Bong actually mentioned has become slightly lower and it, the effort to make that even lower is still sort of work in progress. Uh, and I think that is the biggest change in, uh, in, in terms of the viewership during this pandemic. The, the one inch barrier, of course, is, is by Director Bong, who is the director of Bong Joon-ho of Parasite, talking about the, uh, the subtitles in, in the States, where uh, especially where people, uh, audiences are not necessarily used to reading subtitles, whereas in Asia, maybe it's, it's a little bit different. Um, the, w w with that in mind, I mean, the market keeps changing very, very quickly. But as you say, uh, in a way, audiences all over the world have never been so primed to, to be able to be receptive to these different stories from different local markets. Uh, do you have any hopes for Chinese language content and shows in the coming years? Chinese, I think Chinese language content, you know, this is why I have a team who are expert in this area because I'm not expert in that area. I may help them uh, solve some of the issues that they may face through the experiences that I have. Chinese language content, I, I believe, is very similar to English content. You know, English, con there's so many different aspects of English content uh, from Hollywood, from UK, from Australia, from Canada. I think it's similar, uh, Chinese language content is very similar. 
uh, from someone who doesn't speak the language, who doesn't know the culture, people may think, oh, it's one Chinese language content. I think each different Chinese language content, whether it's from Taiwan, from Hong Kong, has very different characteristics. I believe it's really important to continue to do the ones we are good at, but at the same time, we are, I, as we are in, this, in this world of creating demand. It is really important for us to be constantly coming up with a bigger vision and really not restricting ourselves with, oh, Taiwanese audience don't like this, or, oh, uh, our, our audiences in Korea don't like this. Instead of restricting us to, uh, to what has been known before, continuously coming up with a bigger vision uh, and making sure that we can bring that to life to a great storytelling. And so I think these two, continuing to do things that we're great at, and also at the same time, always pushing our bar boundaries to come up with a greater vision uh, and turning that into stories, I think that's where I believe uh, a Chinese, what I hope to achieve from the Chinese language content. And because in Taiwan especially, the, the creative community, the infrastructure, the skill set of our, our uh, production staff, it's, it's really one of the top notch. So I really want to make sure that we find, uh, we are able to show the world that, you know, not only Korea, not only Japan, but shows that come from Taiwan and the Chinese language content we're making together can actually surprise the world too. Speaking of things uh, changing very quickly over the course of a couple of years, hopefully when you come to Taiwan, you don't have to go around knocking on doors anymore. Uh, hopefully, well, I, <laughs> I have Jerry and Claudia to knock on the door together with me, so, but hopefully, Maybe not. Well, so when it comes to Taiwan, because you mentioned also, you know, that there are different Chinese markets, different dialects, or different ways of creating content. Uh, do you have any specific vision uh, for uh, for Taiwan or how Netflix plans to work with Taiwan coming up? I think the strategy or or the way we work actually is not that different country by country. I think what we want to make sure is. Uh, you know, we have our, our local experts on ground that can actually sort of bridge the gap between how, how Taiwan works as an industry, but how, how Netflix works as a company, um, but be able to, you know, uh, innovate and change the way we work. For example, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the way the L LED sort of the sound stages, so utilizing the virtual production or really giving giving toys and freedom uh, and, and innovation to change the way do uh, way we make shows and we tell stories um, and in that the goal is to make sure it's as seamless as possible so even as and it's it's undeniable that we are uh, we are a international company but we don't want to we don't want to put the burden on partners to make everything, have to do everything in English or, or have to do everything the Netflix way. So being able to create a seamless experience so that our partners will want to give us their, their best content. I think that's the way I want to make sure that we continue to partner with our uh, creators and the producers in, in Taiwan. And I know we're not there yet, we're not perfect yet, but it is work in progress, and I can promise you that we are going to constantly uh, improve. Along those lines, could you share a little bit about what Netflix has done already locally here in Taiwan to support the, the, the local industry? Um, we, aside from the shows that we're, we're making, uh, we've signed an MOU with, with Taika to make sure that we promote the Taiwan uh, content. And also we want to make sure that we bring the Taiwanese content to the world. So a good example could be like incantation when it sort of you know breaks out in, in other countries like Japan, we want to make sure we take that opportunity and we amplify to, uh, and make sure uh, audiences who have not yet seen the show, seen the film, are able to discover that too. Uh, we've also uh, done a workshop, a creative workshop, to um, 
to sort of help some of the creators who are interested in the, in the showrunner system or the way the Bible is sort of written in, in, in the way we do in Hollywood and, or other countries. So we've come up with different, different kinds of creative workshop uh, to make sure that, uh, to enable different types of storytelling. Uh, and we also do have plans on, how should I say, the enhancing like the production innovation. Mm -hmm. So we do have a post-production workshop, the webinars, all different kinds of programs uh, waiting uh, for us in the new year as well. well. We just have a few seconds left. Uh, uh, well, I'll try to sum up some of the takeaways. I don't want to put words in your mouth. If I'm wrong, you, you jump in. It sounds like local stories, uh, not a dirty word. If anything, actually, they're very OK. Local stories are something that Netflix is definitely looking for. Authenticity is a key word when we're talking about the local stories, very personal stories. And then uh, Netflix is here uh, to, to really be a partner to all the local teams that, that help in any way it can to foster the development of these local stories and then find a way to spread them throughout the world. Mm. Uh, and then finally, I think Netflix is just getting started in Taiwan. That's my last takeaway. Exactly. <laughs> I think you've summed it up perfectly. <laughs> Thank you, Min Young Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 好，非常感谢两位精彩的分享，再次掌声，感谢你们，请先回座 ，Thank you，Please return to your seats。